Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Jim Rush. I'm proud to be the Dean of the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, which gives me also the pleasure of welcoming you all uh, here today on behalf of both the faculty and the University of Waterloo for what promises to be a very thought-provoking talk by the Honorable Ann McClellan. Today, as we launch the 50th anniversary of the faculty and the 40th anniversary of the School of Public Health and Health Systems, we're honored to have her here with us. I also welcome the panel members uh, who will be contributing to our discussion uh, after the talk. And I welcome all of you uh, who have come here for this very special event. Some of you have arrived just now. Some may have been present earlier for the uh, launch of the faculty's 50th in the lunch, uh, regardless of whether you are new or have been here for a couple of hours already, welcome. Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, or AHS, uh, emphasizes prevention and health promotion perspectives from a variety of disciplinary uh, approaches that span a whole gamut of social and biomedical determinants of health. We are concerned with complex problems that individuals, communities, and populations face every day, including topics like the one covered during today's Holman Lecture. Founded in a spirit of multidisciplinarity and innovation, in AHS we look back with pride at our accomplishments and are galvanized by our current successes while looking forward to a future of improved quality of life, health, and well-being for all. Ontario's Premier Kathleen Wynne visited the faculty last week and expressed her great pleasure of having been able to have the opportunity to do so at such an exciting time in our history. That comment resonates with our excitement as we embark on our next 50 years of teaching and research, emphasizing a commitment to partnerships and collaborations, to leveraging technology and innovation in the advancement of our work, and to building our international footprint, all to maximize uh, impact in the health and well-being area. This includes the leadership of the School of Public Health and Health Systems in a variety of academic and research pursuits, including the establishment of a new global health institute, a central hub connecting researchers working on global health issues uh, and subjects across the university and also functioning as a global health innovation incubator. In a lovely example of synchronicity, the 40th anniversary of the school coincides with the 50th anniversary of the faculty, the 60th anniversary of the University of Waterloo, and the 150th anniversary of our nation, Canada. Inspired by the Lalonde report that was released in 1974, the then Department of Health Studies was founded as Canada's first transdisciplinary department dedicated to health promotion and disease prevention. The SARS crisis provoked a call to action for this country, beginning with the establishment of the National Committee on SARS and Public Health in 2003. Guess who the health minister was in 2003 that provoked that call? Minister of Health, the Honorable Anne McClellan. The minister asked the committee to build on current public health interventions and foster collaborations, an approach that was eventually transferred from SARS and applied to public health in general. That built further momentum towards the establishment of the Public Health Agency of Canada the next year, 2004. Ever responsive, the Department of Health Studies and Gerontology prepared for and launched on the momentum that built from, that, from those events an online MPH program in 2006, in part to help build public health capacity in Canada, a decided step in the evolution towards the 2011-12 transformation into the School of Public Health and Health Systems. Former World Health Organization Director General and Prime Minister of Norway, Dr. Gro Harlem Brundtland, gave the keynote address at the launch of the school at the University of Waterloo. During her talk, entitled The Importance of Public Health to Global Well-Being, she encapsulated the significance of this new school in this way. With a transdisciplinary approach and by focusing on key priorities in global health, such as chronic disease prevention and management, food and water security, security and governance, and on reducing health inequities as well as poverty, the University of Waterloo School of Public Health and Health Systems makes a major contribution to Canadian and global health. We are proud of the school's accomplishments to date and look forward to how they leverage these accomplishments as we continue to tackle pressing health issues. And today's upcoming Holman Lecture will examine one of these issues as a kickoff event uh, at the start of this celebratory year. The Holman Lecture Series, of which this is part, is one of the tangible ways that we demonstrate to our community the faculty's commitment to promoting health and well-being. 
These lectures were made possible because of a generous and visionary philanthropist whom I would like to tell you just a little bit about now. Lyle S. Holman was a developer and contractor and noted philanthropist in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. He was the recipient of many awards, including the Order of Canada, as well as an honorary doctorate from the University of Waterloo. Generous donations from Lyle uh, with his wife, Wendy, to the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences created a number of endowments to expand and sustain the health promotion activities within the faculty. These endowments have had significant impact on health and well-being of our community through research activities and the spread of knowledge related to health promotion through many outlets, uh, including the session today. We're looking forward to hearing our speaker's perspective on a topic that has caught the attention of many Canadians. I thank all of you for joining us to listen with curiosity and learn about this interesting issue that encompasses the complexity and opportunity found in issues related to health and well-being. At this time, I'm pleased to hand over the podium to Dr. Craig Janes, Director of the School of Public Health and Health Systems, to introduce today's speaker. Craig. Well, thank you, Dean Rush, for uh, your remarks, uh, and, and welcome to all of you here. Wow, this is it's great to see this room filled. Uh, the school is just absolutely delighted to be able to kick off our anniversary celebratory events, whether it's the 40th, the 50th, the 60th, or the 150th, with important, and I think what you'll uh, see are very significant remarks from one of Canada's more notable and productive public servants. So on behalf of the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences and the School of Public Health and Health Systems, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, the Honorable Anne McClellan. A native of Nova Scotia, Ms. McClellan studied law, earning her bachelor's degree from Dalhousie University and a master's degree from King's College, London. After practicing law for a few years, Ms. McClellan entered academia, teaching law at the University of New Brunswick and then at the University of Alberta, where she also served as associate dean and dean. In 1993, Anne McClellan began her foray into politics when she was elected as the liberal MP for the riding of Edmonton Northwest. As I learned from Anne last night, at the end of polling, at the end of the day, she was ahead by only one vote. On recount, the margin of victory increased by 11 votes to a total of 12 votes, uh, not only a reminder that every vote counts, but also it's tough to be elected as a liberal in Alberta, probably. <laughs> <laughs> she quickly became a rising star in the Liberal Party, being one of only four liberals elected in Alberta and was named to cabinet as Minister of Natural Resources. She was re-elected in the new riding of Edmonton West in the 1997 and 2000 elections. Ms. McClellan served as Minister of Justice from 1997 to 2002, with responsibility for implementing new anti-terror and security laws following the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States. She served as Minister of Health from 2002 to 2003, as Dean Rush pointed out, um, and in many ways, uh, by sort of initiating the Naylor Report, we can think of her as really being a, an ancestor in our genealogy of the development of public health uh, in Canada, for which I think all of us here in the school are very grateful. On being sworn in as Prime Minister in 2003, Paul Martin named Ms. McClellan his Deputy Prime Minister. She was also named Minister for the newly created Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Ms. McClellan's appointment was one of a number of women given senior positions in the Paul Martin government. Significantly, she is one of the few Canadian parliamentarians to have spent her entire career as a cabinet member. It's a significant accomplishment, I think. In 2006, she joined the Edmonton-based law firm of Bennett Jones, where she continues to serve as a senior advisor today. In 2009, McClellan was appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada for her service as a politician and a law professor and for her contributions as a community volunteer. In 2013, she was appointed to the Alberta Order of Excellence for her achievements in politics, law, and advanced education. In 2015, Ms. McClellan became Dalhousie University's seventh chancellor. In 2016, Anne was appointed as head of the Task Force on Marijuana Legalization and Regulation, created to provide recommendations on the design of a new system to legalize 
strictly regulate and restrict the recreational use of marijuana. And of course, this leads us to the topic of her talk today. I think we're truly honored to have Ms. McClellan here with us today to share some of her insights and experiences with this important, often contentious, and likely to continue to be contentious, but important public health issue. Please welcome me, wel join me in welcoming the Honorable Anne McClellan. very much, Craig. It's a great pleasure to be here. I won't repeat all the anniversaries that you're celebrating. Let me just say congratulations on all of them. And uh, it, it is uh, indeed a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, and uh, interesting, I think, uh, for me uh, to think that as at the beginning of your anniversary year, you would invite someone to talk about the subject of cannabis. But I think it does speak to um, how um, far we've come, dare I say, in a very short period of time, and uh, some of the very serious questions that people need to be thinking about in terms of where we're going uh, in the future. Let me just say before I, I begin my remarks in relation to uh, my involvement with the task force and our recommendations, the Naylor report coming out of SARS has been uh, referenced here. And I was Minister of Health during the SARS epidemic. Uh, a very difficult time for everybody, especially uh, the people of Ontario and the people in and around uh, the, the uh, GTA. Uh, those four letters had never been put together before in the world uh, when we started to identify that there was something happening in Southeast Asia and that, that something was um, uh, spreading. And uh, all that uh, to say that uh, Canadians were instrumental in uh, helping the world understand uh, what those four letters, uh, SARS, what uh, actually they meant in terms of a contagious disease. Fortunately, we caught a bit of a break. SARS is not highly contagious, but we did not know that at the time, and that is small comfort to the people who died both here and elsewhere. But coming out of that situation, we did. My deputy minister said, well, minister, uh, it's really important for us to do a lessons learned because we knew there had been a degradation of our public health system uh, across the the country and there were good there were reasons for that I wouldn't describe them as good reasons but the provinces and territories even the government of Canada feeling pressure in terms of dealing with acute care and so many of uh, health resources going into acute care as opposed to uh, our public health uh, systems and our prevention uh, defenses so out of that lessons learned and any of you who know David Naylor the deputy said minister I would recommend that we use Dr. Dr. David Naylor, but you have to promise him that he gets to tell you and the government exactly what he believes, sees, and learns, and that it will be completely unvarnished. And anyone who knows David Naylor knows that you get a truth to power. Right? That's, and in fact, his report was so important to the government of Canada, but I would like to believe provinces and even schools like this one in terms of taking what he said and his recommendations. And from that moment on, at uh, both provincial, territorial, and federal levels of government, we began to rebuild our uh, public health systems. We began to train more people in public health. Uh, we had lost a generation, practically practically of public health officials and practitioners. So all that to say, it's really got nothing to do with cannabis, but uh, it, it, since I'm here in uh, the, the school of uh, applied, well, the faculty of applied health sciences and the school of public health and health systems, uh, it's worth, uh, I think, noting the importance of, of that particular uh, time and the Naylor report and everything that has flowed from it. Okay, what I'm here to talk about is cannabis and the task force on legalization and regulation of uh, cannabis. Let me just say a few things by way of introduction. Many of you in this room, some of you in this room perhaps, would be very surprised, as others were across the country, when I was asked to chair this task force. 
Um, there is an obvious reason to some extent in that there are three ministers responsible for this file in the Government of Canada. They are the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Public Safety. I held all three of those portfolios in the Government of Canada. So obviously I have some background, one might objectively say. I would say, however, that for some activists in this space, uh, they would suggest that my history with cannabis was not a favorable one from their perspective. Uh, some of you may remember, for some period of time when I was Minister of Health, I actually operated on behalf of the Government of Canada the only legal grow-up in Canada. And that was at the very beginning of the medicinal marijuana regime. And that grow up, which I hate that expression, I'll come to that later, that grow up was actually hundreds of feet underground in an old mine outside Flin Flon, Manitoba. And those who were using medicinally suggested, and my guess is probably quite rightly, that I had the poorest quality pot in the world. And I, it was so bad that Aislinn, Canada's, one of Canada's finest cartoonists, decided to caricature me and my lousy pot. Anyway, and it's a great cartoon. I have the original. It's one of my cherished possessions. Uh, but uh, active, uh, then a series of other things happened during my time as health minister and minister of public safety. Uh, thereby leading um, someone, and this is one of my favorite stories in relation to my chairmanship of the task force. Mark Emery. Anybody here know who Mark Emery is? Well, come on. He's a leading activist in this space, really. He and his wife, Jody. Um, Mark, who is not a fan of mine, and writes regularly for an alternative newspaper called the Georgia Strait, which is quite a good alternative, alternate newspaper, said when he heard that I was likely to be appointed as chair of the task force, that appointing Anne McClellan to chair a task force on legalization of marijuana is like appointing the head of the Ku Klux Klan to plan the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. So, and then people ask me why I don't miss politics, right? But all that to say that um, my appointment as chair was not universally celebrated uh, by everybody in this space. And perhaps no one was more surprised than me uh, when uh, the government asked me to do this. But having said this, uh, I, I guess I can say uh, unreservedly that I am glad I took up the task force, uh, the chair uh, of the task force. And uh, I. The reason I went into politics was not the politics. It was public policy. It was to deal with complex public policy issues. And let me assure you that the legalization and regulation of cannabis is a very complex public policy issue. But I did not appreciate how complex when I began my chairmanship of the task force. But it has cascading effects through every level of government uh, obviously down to the street level where we all live and our kids go to school and so on. And so much of this, we are at the very beginning in terms of uh, learning um, all the potential consequences, on an, uh, re uh, realized consequences or thought of unintended consequences. Um, this is, and I have used the word brave new world. I've changed that. A student, is Caesar here? Where is he here today? Where is he? Ah, yes, up there. And we had the opportunity to spend some time with, I spent some time with students this morning, and I love always engaging with students, having taught law for some 17 years myself before going into politics. And we decided this morning that actually Brave New World actually is to George Orwellian, and that it's a bold new world. And it is. And then let me uh, really start here in terms of context, as you've heard. The Prime Minister of Canada, a, a then leader of the third party, uh, made the commitment to legalize, strictly regulate, uh, and restrict access to cannabis. And I'm going to come back to that. There's a reason I pause right there.
Um, what we discovered as a task force is that many in this community, and when I say this community, the cannabis community, the activists especially, they've stopped at one word, right? What was their word? Legalization. That's what they heard. The prime minister say he was going to legalize marijuana. They forgot that he also said he was going to strictly regulate and restrict access to marijuana. And we very quickly discovered as we traveled across the country that there was this dissonance and it, because we kept pushing, and if you look at the discussion paper that provided the frame for our work, um, if you look at that discussion paper, really most of it is focused on the how. It's not legalization. You and I could draft one section. We only need one section of a uh, proposed law to say that we legalize uh, something called cannabis. The real hard work is all about the regulation and how we go about restricting access to vulnerable populations. And we quickly discovered that there were lots of people out there who didn't really want to talk to us all that much about regulation because they were focused on the legalization and they would argue that strict regulation was unnecessary or unwarranted. But in fact, we did then meet with lots of people in the public health space, the public safety space, uh, researchers of all kinds who understand the importance of developing uh, an, um, a regulatory framework which meets the key objectives of, of the government of Canada. And I will say a little bit about those in uh, just a minute. Let me say, so our job was how? It was made very plain to us, legalization was a done deal. The government had made that decision. Our job was to give the government advice on how to regulate what would be this new uh, world in which uh, there would be a market, there would be supply and demand, uh, there would be concerns around public health and public safety. And that's what we set about doing. And some five months later, we had 80 recommendations for the government, which I am happy to say were generally well received, even by Mark Emery. He actually said nice things about, not me, but the task force report, which I took um, as um, maybe closing that loop. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, uh, 80 recommendations. Uh, and I'm also pleased to say that the government's legislation, which they introduced just a couple of weeks ago uh, before Easter break in the House of Commons, largely follows and mirrors the 50 recommendations that we made. One other thing I learned uh, by way of small digression, they gave us five months to do this work from beginning to end. And so many people have commented on the fact that that was a reasonably short period of time in which to travel across the country, meet with all provinces and territories, uh, municipal organizations, and so on. But one of the things that I realize is if you had given us a year, we would have taken a year, but I am confident that each of those 80 recommendations would have been the same as they were after five months. As we all know, as a matter of human psychology, I guess you work to fill the available time. Uh, we were given five months, we worked in a concentrated, diligent fashion, and we got the work done. The task force was made up of nine members, including myself. As you can imagine, this is Canada. They represent a diversity of region, gender, uh, which is obviously both those very appropriate, and other uh, diverse uh, considerations, including background and so on. So uh, we had uh, a couple of uh, people, one retired, one presently serving from law enforcement. My vice chair, a remarkable person, some of you may know him, Dr. Mark Ware from McGill University, the, one of the world's leading experts on cannabinoids. Uh, and uh, he uh, was, I, I cannot say enough about how important he was to me, but to the whole task force. And let me stop right there. You saw me pause around the use of the language of marijuana and cannabis. We, uh, thanks to Dr. Ware, our very first meeting as a task force, he said, Let's clear up a few things here. And he's the scientist, keep in mind. And he said, marijuana, 
it's slang. We shouldn't be using it. And uh, we talked about that as a task force, and we agreed that, in fact, if we're in the business of legalization and regulation, if we are taking something from a prohibitory space to a legal and regulated space, let's give it its appropriate name. Let's uh, use the botanical name. It's, uh, some people would say maybe it's treating it with respect, but it's moving away from slang and also provide, uh, so cannabis, the botanical name, and also because we're dealing with more than marijuana. Marijuana often means just dried flour to people. It can have a broader context, but often just means that we're talking here about the whole range in this report of cannabis products. So we thought much more appropriate for a couple of reasons uh, to change, and we did. We changed the name of the task force unilaterally, which is why uh, the title page of the report refers to the task force on the legalization and regulation of cannabis, not marijuana. I would like to be able to tell you all never to use the word marijuana again. I know you will, but I do think that it's important to start trying to get people to think differently about this plant, its complexity, the products produced from its various active agents, uh, of which there are at least 106 identified so far. Are, which also, as we discussed this morning, I had not appreciated when I began, botany is going to play a very important role. I don't know, do you have any botanists here at Waterloo? Do you do any botany? Um, uh, but botany is actually going to be an important uh, part, a, an important study as we move forward. Because we know if those 106, let's say there are 106, that's not even confirmed, active agents in the cannabis plant, We've really studied only one in detail, THC, and there's still a lot we need to know about that. We are starting to learn more about CBD, but we're at the very beginning of that, and that leaves you 104 more active agents that we know virtually nothing about. The complexity of this plant, which I had not appreciated, is truly remarkable. And there is going to have to be a lot of primary research done on the plant and its active agents. And thankfully in this country we have some outstanding botanists who can help us do that. Okay, so I think um, enough by way of introduction. As I say, task force, diverse group of people. Um, they worked hard. Uh, they deserve all the credit uh, for uh, this report. Now. I do have some slides, but as one young lawyer in the law firm of Bennett Jones, where I work, said, Anne, PowerPoint is so yesterday. Now, I don't know what today is, by the way, but uh, the young lawyers in our law firm, I, I think it's because it's static and it's lacking that interactivity or something. I don't know. Anyway, this. Uh, this slide tells you a couple of things, and which you probably know, that cannabis is the most used illicit substance in Canada. Alcohol is actually the most used substance uh, of a psychoactive nature, but it is not illicit, obviously. Uh, it is regulated, but it is not illicit. So cannabis is uh, the most used illicit substance in Canada. And what this tells you is what we already know, which is that this age group of 15 to 24, 25 are the highest users of cannabis. And in fact, that age co cohort probably puts Canada um, in um, the uh, uh, position of having the highest rates of cannabis use in the world. And now, there may be one or two countries where we've seen recently those use rates move up in that age cohort in other countries, but really, we're right at the top in terms of young people in that age cohort, 15 to 24, 25. Here it's broken out for you uh, in terms of usage. And you also see what we all know, which is 25 plus, the usage rates fall way off. Um, past year, 
use. Uh, youth, as I've already said, have significantly higher rates. This is just another way of looking at past year cannabis use, but you can see again, especially that 20 to 24 age cohort. I mentioned alcohol is still the most common um, of these substances. People often look at cannabis, cigarette smoking, and alcohol use together, um, and what you see there obviously is uh, that uh, alcohol is still uh, the uh, way out in front in terms of uh, either cigarette smoking where we have made significant gains in terms of convincing especially young people not to smoke, uh, but what you also see here is their cannabis use increase. Okay. Uh, let's just change gears briefly. Engagement demographics. How do we talk to Canadians about this? Uh, well, we did a number of things. I've referenced roundtables. We traveled across the country and held roundtables with select uh, experts uh, in quotes, those who had experience uh, in the area of many kinds. Uh, who were either identified by us, Health Canada, self-identified, and so on. We met with all provinces and territories, uh, their uh, interdepartmental committees. They all had committees at different stages of development, as you can imagine, in terms of starting to work through about what this bold new world will mean for them. We met with the Canadian Federation of Municipalities, and in many cases met with individual representatives from cities and communities, both large and rural. This was our public engagement, where the public could go online and share with us their views in relation to what this new regulatory regime should look like. I'm not going to work through all this. You could see, no surprise, 41% of the submissions were from the province of Ontario. We were very worried about the small representation from the province of Quebec. So we had, uh, Hill and Knowlton did the analytics for us. We had them go back in and compare the 7% responses from Quebec to see if there were any differences in response in the substance of the response uh, in relation to the other provinces, and there were no differences in substance. So we felt that this, even though 7% was low, that it was generally reflective of what we were hearing from others across the country. Um, age, no surprise again, although here the cohorts are organized a little differently. Uh, most of the submissions came from those between 18 and 34. Gender, no surprise again, 73% male. That's also about the usage rate, although that's starting to change in states like Colorado. You're starting to see with legalization more women uh, use cannabis in various forms. Uh, lots of articles now being written in a very sexy terminology in my opinion you know the pinking of the cannabis industry and that kind of thing um, but certainly I uh, while I find the uh, titles of many of these pieces sexist uh, I do believe that uh, there is no reason why women should not play an important part in this emerging uh, new area uh, language no surprise there and by the way, this was, you went online, the questions were set out, the questions were based, taken from the discussion paper, uh, and uh, we had approximately 30,000 individual responses, making it one of the most responded to uh, federal government consultations uh, in their history. I don't think any surprise there either. Um, so, and uh, we also heard from 350 organizations that were not reflected in those stats. And those organizations were large and small, representing tens of thousands of people. The CMA being the most obvious example, representing Canada's 85,000 doctors, the Canadian Nurses Association, the Canadian Pharmacists Association, all their regulatory bodies across the country had uh, points of view and submissions. Uh, all the major national charities, arthritis, and so on, 
um, uh, made submissions. So actually, the total number of people, if you wanted to put it all together, uh, and no one should suggest that the CMA speaks for every doctor in Canada. Obviously, they don't. Uh, but uh, we heard from tens of thousands of people in, in total when you put together the individual responses and uh, uh, the uh, organizations and associations from which we heard. This is a subject that attracts an awful lot of attention and interest. Okay, the themes that motivated and informed our work. Three that are important. The cautionary approach. There's a lot we don't know in this space. There's a lot we have to learn. There's a lot of research that we have to do, and some of you in this room will be doing it. What does that speak to? It speaks to being prudent out of the box. From day one, let's be prudent. Let's be cautious in terms of what we recommend in terms of the key components of a regulatory regime. Because what did we learn in Colorado especially? That it is so much harder to pull back than let go. Right? And they had to pull back because they had not thought through an awful lot of important things. Their best advice to us was go out cautiously. Go out with, with a tougher regulatory regime than some might expect and see what develops in your country, in your jurisdictions. And if you after five years, or whatever the appropriate year, uh, number of years is, after you've got your baselines and you see what's happening in your communities and what the research is telling us, if you want to loosen, that's much easier than taking back what you've already given as a government. So that very much was our approach uh, as we worked through uh, the development of this, uh, these recommendations. The other themes that motivated our work, one particularly of interest to you here, the protection of public health. The Prime Minister talks about this all the time. The protection of public health, especially as it relates to young people, to minors. You will hear him say that, that one of the key reasons he believes that this is important to do now is in fact to keep cannabis out of the hands of young Canadians Keep uh, it out of the hands, if possible, of vulnerable populations and um, enable informed decision making by adults, right? Those over the age of 18, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, we, we need so much more information around use. What is responsible use? What are the risks to young people, say from the age of 12 to 18? What are the identified risks? What do we know about them? What do we need to know going forward? Which again speaks to caution. Um, and the Prime Minister particularly concerned that in fact young people of whatever age, and come to this in just a minute, uh, buying illegal product uh, in the illegal marketplace. So uh, protection of public health, uh, focusing on youth, uh, high frequency use, potency issues, and making sure that people have the public health information that they need to make informed decisions. The other key motivation here, the protection of public safety. Uh, here you can talk about organized crime. Um, certainly organized crime is prevalent in all drug trade. Uh, nobody's surprised by that. Uh, it's no different for cannabis. There is interestingly wide discussion, and there's a colleague, uh, Neil Boyd, who teaches criminology at Simon Fraser, who has recently done some work suggesting that organized crime groups like the Hells Angels, the Russian Mafia, and so on, are less prevalent in this space than some think. Although I think it's fair to say law enforcement would probably disagree pretty profoundly uh, with Neil. But that's a discussion that is worth having. Uh, and like so much uh, else of this, one needs much better data than we presently have. But in terms of public safety, uh, you want to get as much of organized crime or the illegal market out of this as possible. Uh, the system we create, one of the things we heard in, a, in all the states we visited was whatever system you create, you have to be ready to enforce it. 
because if you don't, the system will simply implode on itself, right? It goes to uh, a, a trust, and we were talking about that last evening a little bit with some people. In terms of trust in the system, don't build a regulatory regime that you know is going to be difficult, if not impossible, to enforce out of the box. Think about what you're recommending, because that just brings disrepute, disrespect to the law, and eventually the system will implode on itself. So it is important, whatever you do, make sure that the system you're creating has a good chance of being enforceable by whoever that is. And that may not always be the police. In fact, often it won't be. It might be inspectors who are inspecting licensed producers, uh, inspectors at re in retail locations, and so on. Um, so, But whatever you create, make sure it's enforceable. And that the punitive elements of this new regime should be focused on the most serious offenses, right? It should be focused on trafficking, illegal production, um, and uh, illegal distribution, especially to minors, and import-export, which would create a series of issues for, among others, the government of Canada in their relations with other nations. So don't, don't criminate, because keep in mind, the whole point here, or a large part of the point here, was to move away for the over-criminalization of minor offenses dealing with cannabis. And certainly, personal possession of small amounts uh, for personal use. So think carefully about where you want to use the criminal law and the purposes of the criminal law as opposed to other, perhaps, mechanisms by which to uh, uh, bring about, uh, legal, uh, bring about uh, appropriate conduct. And those can be tickets, they could be fines, confiscation of, of plants over an allowed number, and so on. But let's be careful about overuse of the criminal law, which I think we have seen in this space. OK, the context in which we worked, I've already said. It's a complex and far-reaching public policy issue. Uh, most people, and I would say most governments, even now do not understand what is about to happen. This has a complexity level that we probably have not seen in a very long time in terms of a uh, public policy issue. Significant diversity on the ground across regions of the country. This both within provinces and between provinces. If there is a place in this country where cannabis culture is normalized, it is the lower mainland of British Columbia. And as we traveled there, you could tell the difference was palpable in terms of our roundtable discussions, our engagements with people, both illegal and legal in the system. Um, other reactions across the country, as you might imagine, were more nuanced. Uh, or um, I wouldn't say we encountered any outright hostility to this project of legalization and regulation. And in fact, if you look at all the recent polling, you know, over 60% of Canadians, although there are regional variabilities, uh, do in fact support legalization, even though it is true that most Canadians don't understand what that word means. But that is not a criticism of most Canadians, because you throw out language, legalization, decriminalization, right? Most Canadians have no reason to understand the distinctions between those concepts. So the polling tells you that Canadians are all moving in a certain direction, and that is away from an overly criminal-based system to something that is more administrative and uh, regulatory with a heavy dose of public health and public safety uh, concerns. Um, diversity within provinces. You know, the province, we went to the province of Saskatchewan and met with their interdepartmental people, and um, their reaction was, you guys, you're here telling us that you want us to make access to cannabis available in northern Saskatchewan. We struggle every day to provide clean water and decent food. And so within a province, outside your major urban areas, there has to be sensitivity in terms of, of how some of these regulations will play out. And if you're talking about 
fair accessibility. What does that mean in um, uh, northern Saskatchewan, where there's one store that sells everything and may not want to sell any cannabis products? And that is, in fact, uh, controlled for in the new federal legislation and in our task force. Gaps in evidence and research, we've already talked about that. No established blueprint to follow. People say, well, why don't you just do what Colorado did or Washington did? Well, first of all, they're states. They're not a country. Uh, we, are, we will be the only, uh, the second country in the world to actually legalize at the national level. The other country is Uruguay. And I love Uruguay dearly, but nobody noticed when they legalized. Right? Were there headlines around the world, Uruguay legalizes cannabis? No, but there will be and are. Imagine the number of calls I got from the BBC about this. Because in fact, and this is another, uh, the bottom comment here, great interest from the international community. Everybody is watching Canada in terms of what we are doing. Some people who might, if we get it right, adopt what we're doing because they want to move in this direction. Others who are looking quite truthfully to say, ha, we told you so, that this would not go well, and reinforce their prohibitory approach to this substance along with many others. Um, so there is, to that last point, great interest from the international community um, in terms of what we're trying to do here. Um, I've talked about the first bullet, uneven understanding, and also, so important, uh, we heard from parents, from school boards, uh, from public health officials, we have to get out in front of this. We have to now, right now, uh, and this was some months ago, be doing the public education, public awareness campaigns so that people know what to expect and that people start to get a handle on the risks and the potential benefits and that there's concrete non-biased, if that's possible, information, factual information that parents, that school boards, that others can use and take in whatever form to help everybody, but especially young people, start to be able to make informed decisions around cannabis and their possible cannabis use. Okay. Our recommendations, you can take a look at those. Um, I'm just going to talk especially to uh, a handful of them that have attracted a lot of attention, but I don't think there are any surprises there for you. I will say that the general framework is one where the federal government, leveraging off the medicinal framework, will continue to license producers. Everyone who produces legally in this country going forward will be licensed by the government of Canada and meet the safety standards, the security standards, and the quality control standards established by the government of Canada. And they have to ramp up. They do not have the human resources or other resources to be able to meet the per uh, perceived supply or the demand um, if in and around July 1st, 2018, unless, and I know they are ramping up there, they are, um, they have hundreds of applications backlogged um, that they are considering. They do a very thorough and thoughtful job, in part because of the security clearances that are required. They do not want organized crime trying to get into licensed production. And organized crime, no surprise, is trying. Uh, and uh, uh, the government especially does a thorough job in terms of trying to do those security uh, clearances. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that we recommend and the government will require seed to sale. You should be familiar with this in terms of gate to plate, in terms of other aspects of our uh, food uh, system, we will do seed to sale, and that means from, and we saw this in the state of Washington, um, in fact, uh, a seed has a barcode, and you can track uh, to the retailer where we were in Olympia exactly where that product in whatever form in that retail shop in Olympia came from. You can track it straight back 
to the seed and where that seed was grown. And that system will be required. One of the big benefits of seed to sale is it uh, is very helpful in preventing diversion into the uh, illegal marketplace. So um, those. And then uh, in terms of the basic framework, federal government uh, re uh, will be um, dealing with uh, licensing of production and manufacture. We have 40 licensed producers today. The provinces constitutionally are responsible for distribution and retail. So the province of Ontario will decide how to distribute and retail cannabis products. Will they use the LCBO? Will they use? Uh, uh, we make a recommendation very strongly. There should never be any co-location of sale of cannabis and uh, alcohol. The chief medical officers of Canada make this very strong recommendation uh, in Appendix 4 of their submission to us. And most public health experts would say there should never be co-location of alcohol and cannabis. Uh, so uh, a group like the LCBO will have to decide uh, if they want, one, to retail it themselves. They should have separate retail uh, facilities. Uh, no one under the age of 18 allowed in, specially trained workforce to explain the products and so on, as you would see in uh, Washington or Colorado or elsewhere. I'm not suggesting everybody selling product in those states is very well trained, but uh, uh, there does seem to be some level of basic knowledge of the product lines being sold. Um, anyway, all that uh, to uh, say that, uh, and I've already talked about the first bullet here, let me just briefly, before I go to personal cultivation, which some of you may know more colloquially as home grow, um, let me um, say a few words about a few other key recommendations. Age, when am I supposed to stop now? No, not quite yet. Um, okay, um, 18, we chose the age of 18. This is quite controversial as you may have noticed. And public health experts, people who work in this area, I think uh, might well have a view uh, on uh, this issue. The Canadian Medical Association, in their submission, quite rightly, went through the brain development, the science of brain development, and said best age would be 25. But even they said, well, that's not going to happen. That's kind of undermines the whole purpose, really. Look at those age cohorts and where your users are, right? You'd still be criminalizing, what, 50, 60, 70 percent of your users, for heaven's sake. Or at least ticketing them or doing something. They would be outside the regulatory framework. And that just isn't reasonable in any way. Um, so the CMA compromised and recommended the age of 21. We went with 18 because uh, that is the lowest age at which in three provinces you are allowed to purchase tobacco and alcohol. And we knew, her, hearing from the provinces, that they would want symmetry with their pre-existing laws in relation to alcohol consumption and tobacco consumption. So in this province, it's 19. Uh, and in my province, it's 18 for both of those substances. Uh, the provinces thought that they wanted national consistency around age, and there is a good reason for that, so you do not move interprovincially from one province to another, um, but uh, the potential of that would exist, especially, you know, cross-border shopping and that, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but we decided that we would go with 18 as a minimum age and leave it to provinces to increase the age if they so chose. And they could increase the age to 21 if they wanted to. But we presume uh, most of them will not go beyond the legal age for purchase of alcohol and tobacco. Why did we do that? Why did we choose 18? Because we have been subject to some criticism for that. Most people would suggest it's too low, although, or, uh, although I did hear from a couple of activists at Simon Fraser that they thought it was too high and it should be 16. But uh, they were definitely, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, <laughs> very small minority arguing for a lower age than 18. So 18, what do we do at 18? 
What do, in the world in which we live, and this goes to enforceability, right? And as a society, 18 is now really the social marker for adulthood, young adulthood, where with reasonable information, we believe people can make informed decisions about their own lives. We let them, for the first time at 18, sign up to serve their country in the Canadian military without their parents' consent. We let, at 18, people vote for the highest offices of the land, their parliamentarians, their municipal officials, their provincial governments. We let them purchase alcohol or tobacco at that age with, hopefully, moderation and reasonable public education to make informed choices. And practically, we also know if you went much higher than 18 or 19, you are still, in effect, either criminalizing or subjecting to some form of regulatory or administrative sanction the bulk of your users. And the, one of the key purposes of this whole regime is to get a lot of those people out of the legal system, be it criminal, regulatory, or administrative. So we felt that with the right public education campaigns, uh, 18, and when you consider the other decisions that young Canadians are able to make at that age, uh, that 18 was where we should go. Uh, so uh, people can agree or disagree, but that's ultimately where we came down. Personal cultivation, let's just take a look at that. The law enforcement wanted no personal cultivation, none. They wanted a bright red line, and you can understand why. That makes law enforcement really easy. If you don't have your medical authorization when the police go through your front door and you've got plants, you have uh, violated the law, and they will confiscate the plants and fine you or whatever else. Um, so three minutes. I've got three minutes. Uh, we decided that really, if we're legalizing, and this goes to another fundamental question that people put in play, are you really legalizing this, or are you just making it a little less criminal, right? And that's actually a really important broad question of philosophy. Are you legalizing or just making it a little less criminal? And here, you could argue if, if we said, no, no personal cultivation whatsoever, well, really, we still think it should be a prohibited substance, and we don't trust you to have any of this, right? Um, so we decided, looking at the various models in states uh, and countries that have legalized, we went with the Oregon uh, uh, model, which is four plants 100 centimeters high. Uh, and some people find that a little hard to accept. But that is our recommendation out of the box. And maybe that changes over time as we learn more about personal cultivation. Let me say this. We actually don't expect a lot of personal cultivation. How many of you in this room make your own wine or beer? Yeah, right? Virtually no one. And it's a hobby, and you treat, you treat that with respect. It's artisanal, and it's a valued hobby, and, and so on. You take pride in it. Uh, we expect that, in fact, going forward with uh, retail availability, uh, that most people are not going to grow their own plants and produce their own cannabis-infused products. As long as your product line is available at retail, uh, people, and especially millennials and younger, some of you who are here, I can't imagine most of you are going to want to grow a four plants in your house and deal with all that and shepherd them and extract the flower and do all that, millennials say, I'm going to stop at the liquor store on the way home to buy my wine. I'm going to stop at the cannabis store on the way home to buy my cannabis of whatever kind for our friends Friday night or Saturday night. And you know what? We've got to get used to that. I am stunned to be saying what I just said to you. <laughs> I mean, I am stunned. But that is the world we have to get used to, because that is the world that we are all entering into. OK, I've got less than three minutes now. We did make a recommendation around personal possession, uh, 30 grams. Uh, it's one ounce. That is basically the standard for possession in public. One transaction, 
at a retail outlet of whatever kind, uh, public uh, to have with you in public 30 grams, one ounce. We rounded it up. We all know it's 28.4. But we thought we would round it up for the sake of convenience for everybody. Um, so per, there is a personal possession limit. Drug impaired driving, I'm not going to talk about right now, other than to say very, very big issue and tough political issue. Uh, law enforcement, very concerned. But as our elected officials, because this is one everybody understands, whether you ever use uh, e ever drug impaired driving, which is a problem now, so this won't be a new problem. Drug impaired driving can potentially impact every one of our lives, just like alcohol impaired driving, whether we drink or not, can impact every one of our lives. This is a very important issue, and if uh, maybe some of the panelists will talk to it. Uh, and we, and I know Jonathan, you're going to talk to this, we recommend at least for the next five years the retention of the medical marijuana stream. Okay, let me conclude by saying this. This, you know, you can look at all 50 recommendations. There, some of them are very specific and uh, others more general. Uh, what is going on here? This, for me, and the more I thought about this, this, the psychology of moving from prohibition to legalization and regulation. I think the psychology of this is potentially the most important of what is going to happen here. We all have to start thinking about this differently, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's parents, uh, whether it's potential users, we all, medical clinicians, researchers, and so on, we all have to start thinking about this differently. We have, since 1923, thought about cannabis along with a whole bunch of other prohibited substances. The same way we thought about alcohol until the end of Prohibition in 1933. Although our history was different than the US, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so all that to say that I actually think the psychology of this is going to be key. Law enforcement, they have been enforcing laws in relation to cannabis for decades. All of a sudden, the officer on the street has to look at this differently and look at the person who has got 15 uh, grams or 30 grams, one ounce, ounce, and say, hey, this person, unless I've got evidence he or she is trafficking it, trafficking it for resale, that person is a law-abiding citizen, right? And that's a new world. And we really have to, I think, come to grips with the psychology of this change. And none of us, I believe, in this room was ever alive the last time, was alive the last time we went through this, because I do not treat gambling in the same way. The last time a society went through this change was with alcohol, and none of us were alive. So, uh, you can go back and do some of the uh, research around the end of prohibition of alcohol. And in fact, there are, even we're 100, almost 100 years on, there are some really interesting similarities. And you can learn about what some of the unintended consequences as we move from prohibition through legalization and regulation might be from the history of that time. But for me, and I leave you with this, I think we, we have to, over time, and it will take time, we have to change our thinking. This is not prohibited. But it is not benign, right? It is not, nobody's saying that. It's like alcohol and tobacco. Those are not benign substances. This is not a benign substance. And we need to learn an awful lot more about it, its risks and its potential therapeutic benefits, for example. But we have to, over time, change the way, as a society, we think about this substance. And there are all sorts of cascading effects in terms of actions and thoughts that flow from that transformation. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for those, uh, I think, <clears throat> Very important uh, and useful comments, and I and I would like to just agree that the psychology of it, and, and that's what hangs me up when I think about legalization, and making that psychological shift, is really going to be probably the biggest biggest challenge that we face. So for our next um, phase here of activities, we've invited some diverse stakeholders 
uh, to talk about some of their pers perspectives on uh, this particular issue. And our professor here in the School of Public Health, David Hammond, is going to uh, be the uh, sort of organizer and uh, moderator of that panel. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dave, Dave is uh, our CIHR Canada, Canadian Internet Institutes for Health Research, Public Health Agency of Canada Applied Chair in Public Health, um, and also has done quite a bit of research on chronic disease, um, chronic disease prevention, global health, in the areas of tobacco control policy, healthy diets, and obesity prevention, as well as harm reduction and drug policy. So, welcome, Dave. Thanks very much, Craig. And I just want to say how delighted I am to see so many community members here today. Uh, we need to do a better job of connecting with the public, and, and today's a start for that. Um, and I wanted to say it's a pleasure and to have you today. I grew up in Anne's riding, and I clearly cast that one vote uh, that put her over the top. Um, but when we talked about who to invite uh, for this occasion, your name came right to the top of the list given your leadership of the Cannabis Task Force. I sat in on one of those meetings. Anne was kind enough to remind me that I snuck out halfway th uh, after lunch. Um, but I have to say, I was struck by my experience. It was health policy the way it's supposed to be and how we teach it to our students, but almost never happens. It was a diverse leadership. They consulted, you heard her, they consulted across the country, and they actually based recommendations on evidence. And last night as I was ironing my dress shirt for today, I was watching some fake news coverage of the American Health Care Act in the US, and I was wondering, would it be rude to point out that the consultation undertaken by the task force is probably more comprehensive than what they did for the American Health Care Act, which of course affects about 20% of the world's largest economy. So I decided it'd be rude to mention that, so I won't. Um, <laughs> And I don't know how many people here, if any of you, have actually had a chance to look at that task force report. I read a lot of regulatory documents. Uh, not many of them are good book club material, but the task force is uh, probably as close as you're going to get. And I wanted to share with you one quote, which I very much like. Um, and the quote starts by talking about the complexity and the challenges and diversity of opinions. And it goes on to say, Quote, however, like scraping ice from the car windows on a cold winter morning, we believe that we can now see enough to move forward. Um, what a wonderful Canadian quote. I drove a 1982 Toyota Tercel with a broken uh, defrost knob on it for about 15 years, so I appreciate that metaphor of looking through the window. Um, but it also acknowledges that there are many different opinions. And so we have, uh, as Craig said, um, some folks here today to talk about some different perspectives. I'm going to introduce them. They'll each talk for a couple of quick minutes. Um, we'll have a little discussion, then we'd like to hear from you. So let me introduce to you Dr. Leanna Nolan, who has served as the Commissioner and Medical Officer of Health for the Regional Waterloo since 2001. Uh, in the role, she's provided leadership to public health staff, paramedic services staff, and partnered with all sorts of different community members and healthcare providers. She's also an assistant professor part-time at McMaster. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Uh, Chris Perlman, who's from our School of Public Health. He's an assistant professor. Uh, he was formerly associate director of the Homeward Research Institute at the Homewood Health Center. He's a fellow of InterRI, which is International Collaboration for Care of Vulnerable Health Populations. And his work focuses on health assessment systems, particularly for people with mental health and substance use conditions. And last, we have Jonathan Zaid, who is a part-time student here, an undergraduate student at UW. He's also the founder and executive director of Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Marijuana, CFAM. It's a national nonprofit patient advocacy group. Uh, and at the age of 14, Jonathan was diagnosed with new daily persistent headache, which is a rare neurological condition that causes constant head pain and insomnia. And after trying different interventions, Jonathan found that he finally gained relief from medical cannabis. And in 2014, um, he really came to prominence in terms of advocating for insurance companies uh, to cover medical marijuana. And he's been a very articulate advocate for medical cannabis insurance coverage. And in fact, uh, he did so effectively with our extended health care plan administered by the Federation of Students at UW. Um, 
So uh, let us begin. Uh, I'd like to first invite uh, Dr. Nolan just to share a few of your thoughts on this from uh, a public health perspective. Sure. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, raise three points that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is in public health, our interest in harm reduction, our interest in safety, and our issue uh, related to smoking. In terms of harm reduction, we support this uh, legislation because we think it's important to discourage the black market. And uh, from a harm reduction point of view, what you want to do is balance access so that those who are currently using um, cannabis uh, can continue to access it and don't need to resort to um, the criminal uh, system, uh, uh, the black market, and also uh, face criminal sanctions. Uh, but we want to balance that to make it uh, not so accessible that we actually encourage use. So it's finding the balance there. And when you have a criminal system, the only tools you have to control are crime and punishment. And as we've seen, it's completely ineffective in actually controlling use. So what we want to do with the harm reduction approach is use regulation to control um, access and uh, provide a better balance. The second piece is safety. We want to protect young people from exposure. And in particular, from a public health point of view, we, we want to prevent or delay use as long as possible. And we also want to and I'll take the opportunity to clear up any misconceptions misconceptions and share health messaging, such as concerns around using and driving, using in the workplace, and also uh, exposure to the fetus. Uh, so there's exposure concerns around uh, pregnancy and using and breastfeeding and using. And in the past, because this uh, was illegal, there was no way to really study the benefits, harms, and impacts. So with a legal framework, we'll be able to look at the impacts at various doses and standardize and impose quality control for delivery. And then my third concern is around smoking. So we do remain concerned about the health effects of smoking and secondhand smoke. Um, if you take cannabis through smoking, it's still a combustion product, and we have the same concerns that we do around tobacco uh, in terms of uh, respiratory effects and effects of uh, risks of lung cancer. So we would want to continue to encourage other methods of delivery, such as edibles, pills, and oil, and we would still anticipate regulation of smoking in public spaces, uh, similar to what we do for smoking. So there is a bit of a misconception that legalization means you can use cannabis anywhere, any place, any time, but rather we would see um, a, a framework where there are controls on who, how, and when it can be used. So harm reduction, safety, and smoking are my three comments. And now, Dr. Perlman, if you want to share your thoughts. Sure. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, um, the, I, I want to speak from the perspective of mental, mental health and addictions. And um, it, I think it's pretty clear that the relationship between cannabis and mental health and addictions is, is probably best described as fairly complex. Um, we're all maybe aware of and, and should be aware of uh, the risks associated with uh, cannabis use, particularly high levels of use. Um, and uh, risk of psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, there's recent studies that have gone so far to suggest causation uh, through genetic uh, types of, uh, of research. And so it's something that's very important to consider given that psychosis typically has an onset in, in early 20s to, to mid 20s. So when we think about you know, age restrictions on, on exposure to cannabis use, it, it's one thing to sort of consider. Um, but the relationship gets a little bit more complicated when we look at other kinds of conditions like depression or anxiety um, as to whether or not, um, you know, there's an increased risk uh, of these kinds of conditions uh, with cannabis use or, or whether or not there may actually be therapeutic effects. And that's, I think, one of the advantages with, with regulation and, and legalization is we can work to, to better understand those relationships and also better understand um, uh, um, the the um, the types of strains and and the compounds in in these products that may have therapeutic benefits versus those that may be detrimental to mental health and addictions. Um, uh, also, the relationship with substance use and the thing we need to keep in mind, I think, is the idea of abuse versus use. Um, you know, so if we think about risk factors for mental health conditions, uh, abuse is a common issue where you, people are using uh, high levels, high doses on a daily basis and, and how that relates to um, um, risk of, of mental health and addictions versus um, uh, recreational use. And so clearly this points, all of this points to um, the safety issues and, and harm reduction factors around um, regulation and restricting access among youth. And hopefully the opportunity that better education 
um, uh, and, and restricted access can prevent use among youth um, because we do suspect that that could lead to, um, to greater health service uh, utilization. And that's something that uh, I'll be exploring in, in research is looking at patterns uh, I, I, of use and how that relates to psychiatric care and use of uh, psychiatric services um, uh, in, on, in Ontario. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so I'd like to give the patient perspective, and I think it's important that we take a bit of a step back and, and see how we got here. So for almost 20 years, patients have pushed the government through the court system to create a distinct medical cannabis regime to allow patients to access this as a medicine. And really, this has created a lot of um, benefits for patients, but a lot of issues um, and concerns in the process because it has bypassed the regulatory pathway for medicines, which means we don't have the full amount of research and information we would typically have when a medicine is approved for sale to market. Um, so it's really important that legalization develops this research, but at the same time, it's critical that patients are protected in this process. So legalization pre presents a big opportunity to do research and to um, allow more affordable and access, but at the same time, patients are suffering from extreme, severe, often uh, debilitating conditions, and we have a duty to ensure that these patients are protected as we endeavor into this uh, bold new world. Um, and to that end, CFAM, along with the Arthritis Society and Canadian AIDS Society, along with 15 plus other health organizations, submitted recommendations to the task force to recommend increased access, affordability, and research for medical cannabis and the benefits and potential harms. And we also helped facilitate a session with the task force where patients from across the country of diverse views um, got to meet with the Honorable McClellan uh, and also a number of other of the task force members as well as Health Canada representatives. And this really turned things around from our perspectives because there's a wealth of anecdotal information as we all know. There's a considerable amount of research even though it's often dismissed. But at the end of the day, these are real people, our friends, our family that are suffering from severe conditions, finding tremendous amount of relief from cannabis and these uh, experiences and these narratives are so powerful that, that really it's impossible to deny. So we need to do everything we can uh, as we progress into legalization to support patients. Thank you. Maybe, uh, Anne, I could invite you to come join the panel. Um, and instead of hearing me ask some questions, what I'd like to do is open this up to the floor. And you know, as I was coming up here, I realized this is, I lecture in this room, and I used to keep paper airplanes for my class when they wouldn't ask questions. And what I would do is throw it out, and whoever it hit, you know, they would have to respond to my question. So I don't think we're going to need to use that. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, what I'd like is to invite people here to, to ask some questions. Maybe you have a comment that you'd like to share. If you are asking a question, if you could try and direct it. Uh, to one of the panel members, that would be great. Now, I think we did have a microphone, which I no longer see. Uh, so if you tell me the question, I will read it back out uh, for everyone. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. I is this working? Yes. I am not aware of um, any work that the government is doing now to get the taxes off. Uh, governments, I think, at all three levels, are uh, looking at um, what a tax regime might look like. Uh, and I will say this, it's, uh, that revenue was never uh, front and center in terms of any of the governments we, we talk to. Uh, and they're very aware that price point in terms of organized crime particularly is important. But to your point, um, we, we felt that 
out of the box, keep the status quo as it relates to taxes. We did not want to see, and, and some healthcare professionals made this point, they did not, and we did not want to see people uh, who were not true medicinal users go to the medicinal system uh, for t a tax advantage. And that has happened, I think, in at least one jurisdiction where there are, is a tax, where there is no tax um, on a medicinal uh, product. So out of the box, we felt maintain the status quo, which is right now, and this is where Jonathan, Jonathan and his group and the task force would clearly disagree. Uh, but I know they will keep lobbying government. And as we work through this and we see what happens in the medicinal space, I think that government uh, should be open to hearing um, the concerns of patients. The other thing is that product uh, for medicinal purposes is not covered by insurance because we we don't uh, these products do not have DIN numbers they haven't gone through the clinical trials uh, that one in our current regime expects to be able to attract a DIN number and then have insurance companies through their benefit plans covered so there are a bunch of issues tax only one that I think need to be worked through uh, as it relates to the medicinal regime Jonathan did you have a point so, uh, you know, I think, of course, we respect the task force uh, a, a position on this, but at the same time, this is an urgent need for patients. I think only confounded by the, the issue of insurance coverage, the government could really take a simple step and eliminate sales tax on medical cannabis. Um, all other prescription drugs, uh, in case you aren't aware, are zero rated, meaning they don't have sales tax. When someone goes to a physician, gets a prescription or what's equivalent to one, um, to treat their illness with uh, a medicine, medical cannabis, it shouldn't be any different than every other prescription they're prescribed. And yes, there may be some potential for abuse, but at the same time, that's not a reason alone to disadvantage the vast number of legitimate patients that need this financial relief. Thank you. Uh, other next questions. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'm gonna do my best Phil Donahue so that we can all hear the question. Most of these uh, prescriptions are getting written by these cannabis medical clinics. Do you see them getting more regulated? Um, Jonathan might want to comment on this too, but actually, uh, first of all, we have about 130 a thousand, 130,000 uh, medical registered with the government of Canada medicinal users, right? They have a medical uh, authorization. And that number has grown very quickly over the past couple of years, I think it's fair to say, Jonathan. Um, although there are some recent stats, polling done, that would indicate that self-declared approximately 800,000 Canadians say they use cannabis in some form uh, for medicinal purposes. You can see that there's a significant gap there uh, in terms of, of those who seemingly self-declare for uh, medicinal purposes. Um, Doctors are reluctant to authorize because the clinical trials have not been done that gives them confidence around dosage, around adverse effects, potential liability, because they don't have the guidelines to help them with those things. And one cannot be unsympathetic to that. Obviously, pharmacists as a governing body also have the same concerns, uh, roughly the same concerns as uh, those who fill the uh, prescriptions or authorizations. Look, I think one, colleges of physicians and surgeons really need to take up this issue in terms of what doctors are, some doctors are doing out there. We know there are doctors signing hundreds of authorizations from people across the country, authorizing hundreds of grams which make no sense to anybody, even if you're a medicinal user using, um, you know, with, with intense pain. Some of the, the authorizations are, are, quite honestly, they're in the thousands of grams, not the hundreds. And 
Um, one doctor, we are well aware, uh, not the doctor, the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Saskatchewan has revoked the license of one doctor uh, for um, uh, practices, um, inappropriate uh, practices uh, in this regard. Uh, and I think colleges really need to be watching. And the Government of Canada does provide, Health Canada provides that information to provincial and territorial colleges. And colleges should be watching this really carefully. Because doctors, I thought it was $175 in authorization. People tell me that doctors are charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars for an authorization. They don't see the patient. It's hard to say how that uh, is in keeping with uh, the uh, medical practices uh, that any college would want to support. Questions? Sporadic applause. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Adam Tavares. I'm a reporter for imprint UW's uh, student newspaper. My question was, I think, mostly directed at Anne, but anybody who has anything to talk to say on the matter, I think, feel free to join in. Um, you mentioned during your presentation how Trudeau is, in, or Prime Minister Trudeau is, he's embellishing a, an approach that protects youth from cannabis use and kind of that seems to be one of his main goals with this. And yet you also mentioned that alcohol is the most popular substance being used by youth today in Canada. I'm just wondering what makes you think cannabis use will be different because alcohol, as we know, is regulated. Yet if we regulate cannabis in the same fashion, will the number decrease, do you think? Is that the goal here? I'm just wondering what makes you think cannabis use will decrease when alcohol use has not. Thank you. I think um, there are probably others, including our public health uh, specialist practitioner who can answer that. One thing I will say, everyone we talk to in the public health space describes alcohol as a failed regulatory regime. And the thing we heard over and over again was do not go that route, which is why, in fact, we designed a unique regulatory regime for cannabis. Alcohol has failed. As a, as the, the provinces and territories are addicted to revenues. And that's not a good thing. Um, so I still have some comments. Uh, Is it on? How old are you? Testing, yes. Sorry. Oh. Um, so certainly, uh, I mentioned before about trying to find the right balance in terms of access. Certainly with increased access, you would potentially expect or be looking for increased use. Uh, the issue right now, though, is that there's already a significant uh, amount of youth using. So that's kind of our starting point. Uh, and we want to implement a system that doesn't promote use. So that's why part of the regulation will include things like, uh, hopefully, plain packaging, not uh, having promotion, not packaging it up in candy flavors or in any way that's going to promote it to young people. Um, also paying attention to the health messages that need to go with that. There are a number of young people that are uh, under the misconception that there's absolutely no uh, downsides for using cannabis, so we need to talk about using and driving, we need to talk about brain development, we need to talk about making decisions to de delay use as long as possible. And, you know, we're going to need to see what our new normal is. Uh, we already have very high levels of use uh, among youth. We're watching what's happening in the states, and although it's still early days, and I can't say we're anywhere near hitting what our, you know, status quo or, or stasis will be, uh, in the early days, uh, with the legalization of cannabis in the states, use has not increased among youth. Uh, it's, it's stayed the same. So we want to pay attention to that because what we really want to do is get rid of the black market and uh, uh, stop criminalizing it. But, but I agree with you, it's something we need to watch very carefully. Hi. I have a question. Um, that is quite thorny actually. So around the issue of impaired driving, I, I appreciate the risk to, can I not use that? Yeah, you have to use that. Oh. I appreciate the risk to public health uh, posed by naive and first time users of cannabis. However, at the same time, 
I'm curious how we're going to balance the rights of those medical users who have been using uh, this plant for decades and have been driving safely and now just because of the arbitrary um, imposition of law and the proposed Bill C-46, how will we balance those rights? Of I think that's a really important issue. Uh, we, uh, it's all about impairment, right? That's, uh, one should be, whether it's alcohol or drug impaired driving, uh, one should be focusing on impairment, not, for example, a trace amount of some substance in someone's system. Um, because of the way alcohol metabolizes and 40 years of experience, we are able with a high degree of scientific certainty to establish a per se limit, which is 0 0.08, right? And we're willing to assume that there will be some in society, a small number, who aren't impaired at 0 0.08, but there's a sufficient degree of scientific evidence and certainty that we're willing to live with that as a civil society in the name of public safety. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, impairment, we do not have, because uh, THC and metabolizes differently in the body, uh, it is not easy to say what that per se limit would be. Uh, we don't and so that's why the task force did not recommend a per se limit. There is a specialized group at work in the government of Canada, the, a group of forensic science scientists, especially established by the Department of Justice, to work with the available science to figure out, is there a reliable per se limit? What you see in the legislation is the government taking I think a cautionary approach, let's call it that. And they establish a, a series of offenses which in essence do establish per se limit. Um, and so two nanograms, that's the UK standard, it's basically zero tolerance, right? Uh, uh, the Australians do five nanograms. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details of the legislation, but you've got a summary conviction, and then you've got hybrid, so you could go indictable or summary. And uh, there are numerical values attached to those. So those are, in essence, per se, uh, limits. Um, Roadside testing devices are getting better all the time, but still, uh, I think a lot more research, a lot more work has to be done. We heard, didn't we, Jonathan, in our patients' roundtable, the concern for uh, medicinal users who have used for a long time. Uh, it's probably small comfort, but one would hope that with a, uh, if one is pulled over uh, and there are no indicia of impairment, right? Uh, that uh, because one can uh, do uh, separate and apart from the oral fluid, you would probably do your uh, standard sobriety field testing. Uh, and with the medical authorization, you hope that the, the law enforcement use good judgment. I know that's unsatisfactory. <laughs> no, not that last bit. That's me. One thing I'd like to add to. <laughs> Look, I think the government realized that highway safety is a major societal issue, whether it's alcohol or drug impairment, and neither of those are new. They are uh, undoubtedly concerned, uh, and we heard this expression everywhere we went, about increased can uh, drug impaired driving because of cannabis. I think they've taken a precautionary approach here. Uh, and defense counsel, no surprise, have already indicated that they are gearing up to take a run at these particular provisions. We don't know how the courts will deal with this. Uh, so I think all I can say, I'm not the government. I know what we recommended. And we said we were not comfortable recommending a per se limit based on the information we had. But, yeah, yeah. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, we're, of course, we're 100% against impaired driving. But I think when we start breaking down what that means, it's about, you know, talking about the presence of THC in a, a medical cannabis patient who's using it every day and may use it just at night even and want to drive the next day and really have no um, impairment. And we're telling patients, you know, 
wait for six hours after vaporization or eight or 12 hours um, after using oral use cannabis to, to drive, and that's a safe time frame. But if, we, if patients are doing that and then they're going and driving, even though they're not impaired, this new um, per se limit set by the government in C46 would basically ban all patients from driving. So patients aren't impaired and they're not able to drive. And we're talking about people with mobility challenges and issues that they really rely on driving to uh, live their life. So now they're choosing between can they use cannabis as a medicine or can they drive, and that's a problem. So in the UK, they've come up with a medical defense ex exception. Right. So people um, who have a medical cannabis prescription and are using it um, according to doctor's authorizations um, can get off of those per se limit charges. Um, of course, you know, if they show signs of impairment by other means, they can still be charged and we support that, but it's important that these um, regulations allow for patients to safely drive while having some THC in their system. And um, I'd just like to add, from a public health perspective, uh, we're obviously going to learn more about this as we go forward. We're just at the very beginning of understanding the science, the impacts, the, the harms, the benefits. Um, but we need to start somewhere. And I think one of the key misconceptions uh, for some people is, in fact, you can't be impaired uh, when you're using, uh, whereas, in fact, you can. So we want to make sure that people don't falsely believe that you can use and it won't affect your driving. Uh, there certainly is the potential for that. And uh, since we're all learning together, I, if you look to, or uh, not Oregon, it's actually Colorado. I haven't looked at their stuff recently so they may be evolving, um, but from a public health point of view, they gave a general message, um, don't use uh, and drive within five or six hours of using. So we have to figure out what that public health message is going to be, use that as a guideline so that people don't think that, yeah, you know, it's fine to, to smoke or use and drive at the same time, for example, because that's a misconception some people have, and we'll go from there. Can we talk about uh, supply for a minute? My wife is on medical marijuana. And we are having trouble at times uh, getting the type of marijuana, the type of cannabis that, that she requires. So we have two suppliers, two legal suppliers, but even going online looking for something like with a high CBD and a low THC uh, might not be available. My question is, all right, when this becomes illegalized, what about all those medical marijuana um, patients? Uh, would there be a priority on some sort of supply issue or... My worry is that is the marijuana, the cannabis might not be there. And I know you mentioned at the beginning there are, are quite a few who have applied for the license to produce cannabis, but how long will that take and would they be ready in time? An important question. Jonathan, do you want to talk about the strain, you know, the supply of certain strains and things that we heard about at the patient roundtable? Because there are concerns going forward in the new legalized market from patients about that. Yeah, so um, as, as you mentioned, um, CBD is uh, one of the components of cannabis, and that's non-psychoactive. So people who are using it for recreational use uh, don't really want CBD in their product. It also mitigates the high that you feel from THC. So, you, so strains in the recreational black market have actually been bred over time to have very high levels of THC, low levels of CBD, whereas patients want CBD. Um, in their products, it has anti-inflammatory and potentially pain-relieving and other properties. Um, you know, the science is still still being worked out on on what exactly it does. But lots of patients are finding it's being used, especially uh, the pediatric epilepsy group. We yeah. heard from um, a mother who uses uh, CBD oil for her uh, son, who has up to a hundred seizures a day, um, and found that by using CBD oil, a non-psychoactive chemical. Um, this medicine is now helping relieve seizures, um, you know, up to 90, 95%. So a huge um, turn of events from someone who responded not at all to any traditional therapy. So it's, it's about supplying these kinds of products that patients are looking for that won't necessarily be in the recreational market, which is obviously a lot bigger, more financial, more financial incentive for these businesses to go after that versus the medical market. So it's imperative that there's a, a supply of the products, but it's also imperative that there's a consistent supply. Um, as you mentioned, right now there's problems. So, you know, going into legalization with, um, you know, all of Canada basically being able to access it, that's, that would be really challenging if the market exists as today. 
And you have a bigger supply and demand question. Yours was about particular uh, medicinal uh, strains. There's a bigger supply demand issue come whenever this system goes green uh, because uh, you know, people are making estimates about demand and then how you meet, uh, how you s provide the supply. Uh, we have 40 licensed producers. Uh, yes, the government is ramping up to license more. Uh, those who are already licensed are uh, getting ready to increase their production, but there are estimates about, at best, about demand and then uh, the necessity uh, to try and meet supply uh, needs uh, or demand needs through adequate supply. And it's not only the amount of supply, to your point, it's the strains. There are some producers presently in the system who have said that they, they want to uh, probably carve out a niche and only do high CBD uh, and leave the adult recreational market, which is looking for high THC, to others. Whether that plays out, we don't know. But in the task force, we say the government's got to watch this really closely on behalf of patients. And if patients are not able to get uh, access to supply or the strains they need, that the government may very well need to intervene in some way. Okay, I think we have time for two quick questions. Uh, one down here and then one up here. Yep. Hi. My wife and I are here uh, out of concern mainly for medical marijuana. We have two family members, myself, and I have mobility issues and the CBD helps that so much. But we also have a grandson who has been diagnosed by a psychiatrist with intermittent explosive disorder. And this is a wild one. When he has one of these sessions, he, he, he completely loses, becomes super angry, you can't reason with him. He takes a little bit of cannabis and within five minutes he's a normal guy. Now. What has happened in the past if he is out there and has kind of a spell, which he had yesterday at uh, down at the Fairway Mall? Immediately he attracts, you know, the police are brought and they think he's some nut bar. They could be fast with the taser gun or fast with a gun. And so. We had to leave, jump in the car, and drive up there yesterday because his girlfriend was screaming in the phone that he was having a session. So, like for him, it's a life-threatening situation, and, and he has to have this <clears throat> because, you know, he could just lose it. Oh, by the way, if you haven't seen one, there's a little license thing. I'm licensed, I can be here. <laughs> yeah. So other points have been covered here. But now, myself, when I'm helping him, we place the orders. You have to go, you know, to two different companies. You might see one has a better one, one has another one. But we're set up and licensed with one supplier. And these guys have been running out lately. So if I had insulin, and I needed insulin, and I went to the drugstore and they didn't have any, I can't go to the next drugstore and get it. So somehow these rules really need to be done and done fast because the medical guys are getting put through the ringer while the other stuff is being worked out or being forgotten. So. I, I, Thank I you don't know. I hope something can be done in this, in this realm. Oh, yeah. The, now points? wait. The Compassion Club. Just one second here. It, it has been closed down. Quick, quick question. Just so we can move on to the last one. Yeah, I will. Thanks. I, I will. Uh, Comments. Uh, uh, Comments. I think you raise very good points. You might like to comment from your experience in terms of the. <laughs> Whatever you want. You're the psychiatrist here. Well, um, to, to be uh, upfront, I'm not a psychiatrist. Oh, okay. But uh, <laughs> I know many, and uh, they're, uh, they're um, 
um, smart people. So um, it, it brings up an interesting point related to um, um, the balancing, I guess, of the issue between what the, the risks of harm are related to legalization and, and regulation um, for um, you know, incidents and prevalence of, of psychiatric conditions, exacerbation of conditions, um, um, complications with treatment of, of mental health conditions. And on the flip side, the potential therapeutic role um, that, that could be played, and that's why it's so encouraging to hear that there's still uh, a medical uh, stream uh, related to, to regulation, and, and maybe you know, further research to explore uh, what the therapeutic benefits could be, um, but at the same time considering um, the risks of harm uh, related to the substance. Um, just, uh, I'm curious uh, what the panel, how, how the panel would advise the government on handling those folks who have been convicted of uh, cannabis use. Uh, is there, you know, what do you do about those folks in terms of their convictions? That was not part of our mandate. <laughs> but certainly it came up at a number of the roundtable discussions. That is something for the Government of Canada to decide how they want to deal with that going forward. There are some complications, especially in relation to convictions that are in some jurisdictions over five years old. Information is missing, never kept, all sorts of things. Very practical uh, concerns that were brought uh, to our attention by provincial ministries of justice and prosecutors. Uh, but it's absolutely an issue, and I think Mr. Trudeau in his interview at Vice uh, last week indicated it was something that the government legalization in, in and around July 18. But they're very aware that it's an issue. I know that was, a, but you two, you guys, you've been sitting there, that, that woman gray, in gray, you have wanted to ask a question. I'm just being unilaterally bossy, which I usually am. <laughs> okay, can we just get the microphone, David? I, I have unilaterally said this poor woman has been sitting here waiting to ask her question, so I've just unilaterally decided she can ask it. Thank you. So I'm VP of Marketing and Communications for a publicly traded licensed producer, so I can okay. kind of talk to the supply issue a little bit. Yeah. Part of our issue is we don't get information from the government until everybody else gets it, so we don't know how to plan things. The other part of it is one that people don't really realize. Licensed producer, anyone who works with cannabis has to have security clearance. It's yes. person in charge, pit clearance. The government's now taking up to a year for clearance. We have some people who have been waiting 18 months. That means licensed producers can't grow. That means supply can't grow. So that's kind of an answer to that. So if the government could speed up, that would be helpful on that side. Um, so my question comes down to, you mentioned that we need more information into the public. And I also wanted to tie that into plain packaging. Um, licensed producers are under strict, strict, strict mandate by the government not to talk about anything. Yep. We can talk about everything except cannabis. Um, <laughs> and we can't show anything. I don't know if people know, but we can't even show the corner of a leaf. We can't show a seed. We can't mm -hmm. show anything. So we are highly restricted. We can't even reshare an article from CBC talking about what the government might be doing about legalization. So we're very restricted. So where is the information going to come from for the public that isn't from a negative angle? Well, I think the public, uh, the, the information uh, can come from governments, departments of health, and elsewhere. Uh, that's why I said factual information. Uh, that information should not be biased. It can come from uh, public health officers and their experiential. Um, they can input into public education campaigns. Um, but you're right, and the task force recommends um, that the government, and they will do this, look very closely at the model for tobacco. And at least, again, out of the box, caution, um, uh, plain packaging, but for the name of the company, the, uh, the approximate amount of THC. Look, 
as I said, people compare this to alcohol. Alcohol is a failed public health model. You talk to public health officers, if they could go back and redo alcohol, they would do it all differently, right? Um, so I think uh, that's not the model we're working from. Um, and th that's not to say that we didn't look at it and pick uh, you know, where there were things we felt met our basic principles of public health and safety. Well, I think, I think in fact people could, but this goes to what Colorado learned. If you give, it's awfully hard to take away, and you will have industry, as they discovered, come down you, on you hard. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but they've got a lot of sunk costs, right? And that's what Colorado learned. And yes, they did change the rules around packaging, especially appealing to kids. They prohibited certain lines, like gummy bears, that, that you know, uh, appealing in the shape of animals and things. But industry fought back hard, and they are still very aggressive uh, in Colorado in terms of any changes. So one would expect the same kind of entrenched battle with alcohol. Uh, we're coming out of the box, new industry, new opportunities, uh, and therefore one hopes that we can learn from all these other experiences where there's been failure, where there's been success. Certainly the task force was fully aware that licensed producers would not be happy with our recommendations around branding and promotion uh, because they do come very close to the plain packaging kinds of rules uh, that uh, we have for tobacco. Uh, but public education is key. I know you talk, you talk, for example, if Jonathan called into your LP for for his uh, um, product, you, uh, I've heard, I mean, at your call centers, you are talking to people. You are talking to them about your strains. You are talking to them about your proper, the various properties. Oh, well, don't blame me for that. But, uh, but you know, I think the basic point is an important one. Public education, and maybe, maybe going forward, this is something, as you see how the market develops and everybody operates in this market, that there's more space for LPs to talk about the various qualities uh, of their different strains. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you especially to uh, our audience for very uh, thoughtful questions. Thank you to our panel. You know, this reminds me of a, a, a quote I remember from an old class in political science many years ago about the role of public policy. And it's really to sort of puzzle through solutions on behalf of the public. And I think what we've seen here is a very good case in point of, of this kind of puzzling through the use of available evidence to the extent that it exists to try and come to some kind of a solution on behalf uh, of the public. And I think for those of you thinking about research careers, I think you've, you see an abundant uh, number of uh, very important research questions that will flow out of, of this particular initiative. So you might have your career sort of set for you. Um, but again, let me thank all of you for attending. Um, and I think especially to the organizers and all their hard work that they put into this event. I, I certainly want to acknowledge the very hard work of, uh, of Ellen McKechn, Professor McKechn, who is Put it, who, who has done uh, the lion's share of, of the organizing. So thank you very much, Helen. And let's give one more round of applause to our speakers and our panel.